introduction and uh, thank you all for uh, coming and listening to my talk. Uh, the archive preprint uh, for this paper was put up just today, uh, so it's nice and fresh. <clears throat> uh, so the way I'm going to start out this talk is by assuming that not everyone knows what Chernvay theory is, and even if they do know what it is, perhaps they haven't seen the approach that I'm going to take here, which is very useful for foliations. So I'm going to start out by trying to motivate Chernvay theory. I'll then outline how it works for manifolds, and I'll in particular outline how it works going via jet bundles, uh, which is very useful for foliations. I'll then talk about regular foliations and how characteristic classes can be defined via Chernvay theory for regular foliations. I'll discuss singular foliations and the sorts of foliations that uh, the techniques that I'm going to present apply to, and then discuss how these techniques apply to these singular foliations. Okay, so to motivate it very quickly, uh, recall from the Duram theorem that the Duram cohomology groups of a manifold are isomorphic to the singular cohomology. So what this means is that we can access the topology of manifolds via calculus, which is to say geometry. So the question is, um, can you give some algorithm for constructing uh, characteristic classes for a manifold using geometric data, for instance, a Riemannian metric? And this is broadly speaking, the question that is answered by a Chernvay theory. <clears throat> so just to recall, a principal fiber bundle is a fiber bundle over a manifold, which carries a fiberwise transitive and free action of a Lie group G. Effectively, what this means is that the fibers of this bundle are all isomorphic copies of the group G, and it has this G action. Um, and then we single out a special class of uh, one forms on the total space of such a bundle called principal connection one forms. The whole point of these is that they are one forms on the total space which take values in the Lie algebra of the structure group. And their purpose is that they allow you to lift paths from the base manifold to the total space uh, via an equivariant ordinary differential equation. And then there's this gadget here associated to any principal connection is the curvature, which is given by this expression. It's again a Lie algebra value form. And effectively what this does is it measures the failure for higher dimensional submanifolds to lift to higher dimensional submanifolds. Okay, so these are the basic tools we need to understand Chernvay theory. Um, and here's essentially the process that you go through to obtain characteristic classes. So you start out with your connection one form on your total space of your principal bundle, you compute its curvature, and then you apply what's called an invariant polynomial to the curvature. This is an invariant polynomial on the Lie algebra of the structure group. So it applies to the values that are taken by the, the two form that constitutes the curvature. And by the properties of the invariant pol polynomials and of this curvature form, it turns out that these differential forms phi omega that you end up with, they actually descend naturally to forms on the base manifold M, right? So in other words, we get a map from the uh, algebra of invariant polynomials on the Lie, on the Lie algebra, and they map to um, differential forms on the base manifold. And of course, their image consists of closed forms. And when you pass to the RAM cohomology, what you find is that the induced map on cohomology does not depend on the connection that you chose. So in other words, uh, this process is giving you um, genuine topological information, which is not dependent on these geometric objects, these connection forms that you have chosen. <clears throat> so what does this mean in the context of manifolds specifically? So for any manifold, we have something called the one frame bundle. And what the one frame bundle consists of is, well, it's a principal fiber bundle. And over each point X in the manifold, the fiber is the collection of all one frames, which is to say first order Maclaurin polynomials of embeddings Rn into M. You can think of these as just coordinate charts. So here I'm assuming that N is the same as the dimension of the manifold. Um, what is equivalent, and this is how it's usually thought of actually, is you think of these uh, one frames as linear isomorphisms from the vector space Rn to the tangent space sitting over the point X. So um, 
what does a principal connection form give us in this, in this context? So by the way, the structure group of this fiber bundle is the general linear group on, on Rn. So what is a connection? In what sense is this a geometric object? Well, it's the same thing as just a covariant derivative. Uh, so for those of you who aren't geometers, just recall that a covariant derivative is a differential operator which allows you to differentiate vector fields along other vector fields. And it has to satisfy this property. You can think of it as something like a directional derivative. So it might seem a little bit strange that these two things are related, but locally you see their relationship popping up uh, quite immediately. So locally, any such differential operator is given by a sum, an exterior derivative plus some matrix, um, a matrix living in this Lie algebra, in fact, of one forms. And it turns out that these local uh, matrices of one forms are just the pullbacks of this principal connection by an appropriate local section of the of this principal fiber bundle. <clears throat> okay, so that's principal connection forms covered for the frame bundle. What do the invariant polynomials look like on the general linear Lie algebra? Well, as a ring, uh, this algebra is generated by these maps. So we take our matrix living in our Lie algebra. We multiply our matrix by itself uh, some number of times, i times here, and then we take the trace of the resulting matrix. And this is the polynomial that I'm referring to as C subscript i. <clears throat> and then there's this well-known theorem which just says, well, it's really a corollary of the theorem I showed you before, the more general Chernvay theorem. If you have a principal connection form on the frame bundle of a manifold, it determines a map from this algebra of invariant polynomials to close differential forms on M. And the descent of this map to cohomology doesn't depend on the connection you chose. So it doesn't depend on the covariant derivative that you chose. Okay, so here's where things maybe start getting a little bit different to what uh, many of you may be used to, unless you've done a lot of work with foliations already. <clears throat> One can equivalent, equivalently formulate all of this stuff in the language of higher frame bundles. So if I have a manifold M, then I say that a two frame over a point X is the second order Maclaurin polynomial of, again, some coordinate embedding into the manifold. Uh, so I can no longer identify this with anything um, nice like uh, linear isomorphisms. You really do need to think of this as a, as a Taylor polynomial. But this turns out to be an extremely useful object, this bundle of two frames. And what makes it so useful is that there exists this beautiful differential form on the two frame bundle called the tautological one form. And it takes values in the Lie algebra uh, GL. And the way it's defined is as follows. So if I take a time derivative of some one parameter family of two jets, well, I map this tangent vector to this expression here. Uh, so what's going on here is we have this one parameter family of local diffeomorphisms of embeddings from Rn into my manifold. Um, this is a map from Euclidean space into the manifold. And then I map back via the inverse of where t is equal to zero here. So what I get is a one parameter family of maps of diffeomorphisms from Rn to Rn. I take its Jacobian at zero. This gives me a one parameter family of uh, general linear matrices, and then I take the time derivative time derivative at zero of this one parameter family. So this is of course an element of the Lie algebra of GL. So the the n by n matrices. Um, now, if you work through some of the properties of this one form, what you find is that it's equivariant in the way that you would expect for a connection one form. It's also uh, vertical in the sense that you would expect for a connection one form. And there's this wonderful theorem due to Kobayashi, which says that this is not a coincidence. Uh, so in other words, torsion free principal connection forms on the one frame bundle are in bijective correspondence with equivariant sections from one frames to two frames. And the correspondence is just given by this formula. Um, so your principal connection form is the pullback via the section you've chosen of this tautological connection one form on the two frame bundle. So with this, we can reformulate the classical Chernvay 
homomorphism. And in fact, you can do this for general principal bundles as well, but I'm going to focus just on the case of frame bundles for now. Using the tautological one form on two frames, we get this canonical characteristic map. So this one form has all the properties we would expect from a connection form. We can take its curvature so we can define this tautological Chernvay homomorphism. And this characteristic map has the property that it makes this diagram commute whenever you choose a principal connection form omega. So you choose your connection form omega that corresponds to some section from one frames to two frames, which is equivariant under the action of the general linear group. So it descends to this quotient and then you get this commuting diagram. So, so far, this is not really introducing anything uh, particularly new. It's just a new perspective on um, a fairly well-known phenomenon, but it's one that proves to be very useful for foliations. Okay, so we can get uh, more refined information if we consider metric data as well as just this covariant derivative data. Uh, so if we consider a Ramanian metric on our manifold, then we can consider the bundle of orthogonal frames. Uh, so these are um, linear isomorphisms that are also isometric from the vector space Rn with its canonical metric structure to the tangent spaces of the manifold. This is called the orthonormal frame bundle associated to the metric Ramonian metric G. <clears throat> and this is a principal ON bundle, ON being the orthogonal group. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, you can always find uh, principal connection forms on this principal ON bundle, and these correspond to what are called metric compatible connections or metric compatible covariant derivatives. So in other words, whereas ordinary principal connections corresponded to covariant derivatives or directional derivatives, metric compatible ones corresponds to those connections for which you have this uh, product rule type property with respect to the, uh, the Riemannian metric G. Okay, so why do we get more re refined information out of this? Well, it's because if we take a, uh, a matrix living in the Lie algebra of the orthogonal group, these are your anti-symmetric matrices. If we take any such matrix and then we wedge it together with itself uh, an odd number of times, we get an anti-symmetric matrix back. So when we take its trace, we get zero, right? So what this means is that for the odd I's, these generating polynomials CI give us zero on the nose, provided we choose a metric compatible connection. Um, now, what this means is that for an arbitrary connection, these polynomials should give us zero in Durand cohomology. So when I is odd, we should be able to find transgressions of these forms, uh, regardless of the connection that we choose. And indeed, this is the case. So the person who has worked this out most explicitly to the best of my knowledge is Gujolet. And what Gujolet showed is that if you have any principal connection on the bundle of one frames, uh, then you can define this odd degree form, which is called H sub I, where I is odd. And it's given by this uh, arguably quite ugly looking formula, at least compared to the CIs. But the very nice thing is that it satisfies this transgression formula. So D of HI is equal to CI when I is odd. And again, this, this is for any principal connection. This does not have to be metric compatible. And even better, these forms HI descend to forms on this quotient fiber bundle. So one frames quotient ON. And I'll talk a little bit about this fiber bundle uh, soon. This is a very special fiber bundle. Uh, but first, I'm just going to discuss how we can incorporate these transgressions into the algebra of polynomials we were talking about before. <clears throat> so we have this ordinary uh, polynomial algebra generated by the CIs. We know that the odd CIs are transgressed by HIs. So we um, adjoin it with this exterior algebra on these odd generators HI. And the differential in this algebra WON is just defined by setting the CIs to all be closed, which is exactly what we would expect, and by setting DHI equals CI whenever we have the odd I. So this is exactly replicating this formula that we saw here. 
and then we have this theorem. And again, it's not saying much in addition to what we've already said, but it's building up to uh, foliations, which is where this perspective really becomes useful. If we have any principal connection form on the one frame bundle, we get a homomorphism of differential graded algebras from this, this algebra WON to the differential forms on one frames modulo the orthogonal group. Okay, so now I want to, um, well, let me also uh, note that this passes through two frames in the usual way. Um, so this, this is more or less exactly what we saw back here. It's just I've replaced this uh, simpler polynomial algebra with WON, which also encodes the transgression information. But otherwise, this is saying exactly the same thing. We have this tautological form on two frames. Uh, choice of principal connection is the same as a choice of section, and then we get this commuting diagram. Okay, so onto this arguably mysterious bundle one frames mod ON. Uh, this is what Alan Kahn called the bundle of metrics. And the reason it's called this is because it turns out Romanian metrics on your manifold M are in bijective correspondence with sections of one frames modulo ON. And the correspondence is given explicitly by this formula. Uh, so given such a section, uh, if we evaluate at a point, this gives us a linear isomorphism from the vector space Rn to the tangent space over x. Okay, so we can feed a uh, tangent vector into its inverse, and we're going to get a vector in Euclidean space here. Similarly, we get a vector in Euclidean space here, and we take their dot product. And this defines a Riemannian metric on the manifold M. And it turns out every Riemannian metric can be achieved in this way. So Riemannian metrics are in bijective correspondence with sections of this so-called bundle of metrics. Uh, one of the really nice things about this bundle is that its fibers, GL mod O, these are uh, globally symmetric Riemannian spaces of um, non-positive curvature. Uh, so what you can show is that in fact, all of the fibers are contractible. And what this means is that if we pull back any differential form on the bundle of metrics via a choice of metric, so we get differential forms on the manifold, well, this pullback actually defines an isomorphism in Durand cohomology. So as far as constructing characteristic forms are concerned, we're perfectly happy to land in the differential forms on the bundle of metrics because it's uh, cohomologically, it's isomorphic to M. Um, and like I said, uh, I believe it was Alan Kahn who named this bundle, the bundle of metrics. And I would say it was also Alan Kahn who popularized its use. Uh, so one of the beautiful features of this bundle <clears throat> is that it admits a, uh, a tautological Romanian structure, um, which has the property that it's invariant under, uh, under the lifts of arbitrary diffeomorphisms from the base manifold M. So if you take any diffeomorphism of the base manifold M, it lifts to a diffeomorphism of the total space of this bundle. And the tautological metric <clears throat> on this bundle <clears throat> is diffeomorphism invariant. So this is a beautiful fact which Alan Kahn used very successfully uh, in his uh, study of transverse index theory. And it continues to be a fairly standard um, tool of choice for those who wish to look at uh, transverse index theory for foliations in particular. Okay, so putting everything we've got together, if we take a connection form on the frame bundle of our manifold and we take a Riemannian metric on our manifold, then, well, the principal connection form gives us a map into the uh, differential forms on one frames mod ON on the bundle of metrics. And then this can be pulled back via a choice of Riemannian metric to differential forms on M. And this just gives the, the usual Chernvay homomorphism, pardon me, on cohomology. So in particular, the morphism on cohomology doesn't depend on the connection or the metric that we chose. Um, well, actually, a Riemannian metric gives us a canonical connection form as well, called the levi shavita connection. So given any Riemannian metric, the levi shavita connection is the unique torsion-free metric compatible connection that one obtains. And you can build everything into this commuting diagram now. <clears throat> 
Okay, so given a Ramanian metric on the manifold M, we get not only the section of the bundle of metrics corresponding to our choice of metric, but we get a section from one frames to two frames corresponding to the levi shavita connection, right? And because the levi shavita connection is torsion-free, that's what guarantees the existence of this section. And then we get this, this commuting diagram. So we go from our uh, algebra of in, invariant polynomials. You can map up to two frames via the tautological connection one form, and then pull back via these choices of sections. Or you can just choose the levi shavita principal connection form, and you get a similar map into Duram forms on M. OK, so it's worth mentioning here again that all of this additional work we've done has not really given us anything new for manifolds specifically. Um, but for foliations, which I'm now going to discuss, this, these uh, different perspectives really end up being crucial. Whoops. Uh, so here's an example of a foliation. You get any non-vanishing vector field of the plane defines a foliation via the integral curves of that vector field. Here's a slightly more interesting foliation. If you take the uh, solid cylinder, you can foliate it by cups. And um, even more interestingly, if you then quotient that foliated cylinder by the action of the integers, you of course get the solid torus, but then these cups fit together into a beautiful foliation of the solid torus called the rape foliation. Um, but one of the things you'll notice about all of these foliations, if you look closely enough at them, is that they all have the following local structure. So they're all locally trivial. Uh, so locally, the leaves, the, the layers of the foliation, all just look like uh, flat copies of Euclidean space stacked together in a trivial way. Uh, so this is called the trivial foliation. So to be more precise, what we know is that uh, every point in a foliated manifold has some neighborhood uh, equipped with some set of coordinates. Well, the coordinates have this this lovely property, which is if you take the last Q of these coordinates, then the leaves are carved out as the level sets of these last Q coordinates. Q here denotes the co-dimension. So in this case, the co-dimension would be one. The co-dimension is the dimension of the leftover space, roughly speaking. Here, the co-dimension is again one, and here, co-dimension one, co-dimension one. All of these are co-dimension one. Um, co-dimension one is by far the easiest to draw and, and find pictures of. Uh, but the theory that I'm going to outline works in arbitrary co-dimension. So this is the idea. You can find foliated charts which have what are called foliated coordinates. The yi's, which are the coordinates whose level sets define the leaves, these are called the transverse coordinates. They correspond to uh, coordinates for the leaf space or the, the space of layers, layers or leaves, roughly speaking. And the xi's are called leafwise coordinates. And the, the tuple that we get by putting these together is called a foliated chart. Uh, this property here is really crucial. So it turns out for any foliated manifold, you can always find a covering by uh, foliated charts for which the change of coordinate maps have the following form. So you notice that the leafwise change of coordinates, well, they depend on not only the leafwise coordinates, but the leaf space coordinates as well, the y beaters. But the leaf space changes of coordinates, the transverse changes of coordinates depend only on the transverse coordinates. So if you were to look at this naively without knowing I'm talking about foliations, you would probably say, well, it looks like I have the coordinate changes for a manifold here. And um, in a sense, this is true. There is, a, there is a leaf space associated to any regular foliation, which is nice in the sense that the changes of coordinates associated to the leaf space take this form that we are familiar with uh, from manifold theory. Um, so what this means is one might expect to be able to construct characteristic classes for the transverse space or the leaf space of a foliation in the same way that one constructs characteristic classes for manifolds. And indeed, this is true. Uh, you just need to change the definitions a little bit. So instead of frames for a manifold, we have transverse frames for a foliated manifold. So a transverse K-frame 
is the k-jet, remember this is just a k-thought in the chloran polynomial, of an embedding from q-dimensional space, q de denoting the, uh, the co-dimension of the foliation into the manifold M, with the property that when you post-compose by any transverse coordinates, so you get some map from RQ to RQ, uh, this composite ends up being a local diffeomorphism of, the, of this Euclidean space. So this is what we call a transverse K-frame. Um, and we have associated bundles of transverse K-frames, and in particular, the bundle of transverse one frames is a principal fiber bundle. It's principal with structure group GLQ, where again, Q denotes the co-dimension of the foliation. And this, this notation here, M quotient F, this is usually the notation reserved for uh, leaf space. So you should think of these as uh, frames for the leaf space of the foliation. And what you can show is that principal connections on one frames are in one-to-one -one correspondence with covariant derivatives or directional derivatives on this vector bundle called the normal bundle. So it's the quotient of the tangent bundle of the manifold by the tangent bundle to the leaves. Uh, so the tangent bundle to the leaves is exactly what you would expect it to be. In this case, it's the tangents to all of these uh, gray planes. And in this case, it's the tangents to these, these layers here. So the normal bundle should be thought of as something like the, uh, the tangent bundle to the leaf space of the foliation. And uh, just as we had with the bundle of metrics, this one frames modulo OQ is a bundle of transverse metrics. So these, this is a bundle of metrics on the vector bundle nu f, the normal bundle. So when we put all this together, we get uh, again, by essentially an application of what we've already talked about, a Chern-Weil homomorphism. So we get this map from WOQ, this uh, algebra of invariant polynomials, pardon me, um, to differential forms on the bundle of transverse metrics, which when you choose a metric on the normal bundle, pulls back to differential forms on the manifold. So this is a, a Chern-Weil homomorphism for the leaf space of the foliation, roughly speaking. <clears throat> well, for foliations, things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, so here, it looks like we're getting nothing new out of our characteristic classes. But it was discovered by Gobion and Vey in the 1970s that there is some kind of strange phenomenon that happened for foliations. So we say a foliation MF is transversely orientable if the tangent space to the leaves can be defined as the kernel of a non-vanishing Q form on the foliation. And you can show by an application of the classical Frobenius theorem and a little bit of work that the exterior derivative of this Q form defining the foliation lies in the ideal generated by that Q form, which is to say you can always find some one form eta so that d phi is equal to uh, omega is equal to eta wedge phi. And then it's not too difficult to show that if you take this differential form eta, you wedge it with its derivative q times, you get a closed differential form. And its class in Durham cohomology turns out to be independent, both of the choice of phi defining the foliation and of eta, for which one has this equality. Um, but notice that this differential form, uh, it lives in odd degree Durham cohomology. And the chern weil homomorphism we had previously, in cohomology, it induces only even degree cohomology classes. So this is telling us that there's something interesting going on with foliations that we don't see with manifolds ordinarily. Uh, but with all the tools that we've uh, developed, it's not too difficult to see how these things arise. The only, uh, by the way, this, uh, the cohomology class defined by this eta wedge d eta to the q is called the gobion weil class and it's been studied for, for many decades, very well known. So the only ingredient we need to be able to explain these uh, new differential forms, these odd degree differential forms is Bott's vanishing theorem. So what Bott's vanishing theorem says is that if we have a foliation of co-dimension Q, then any monomial uh, of total degree greater than two Q in these uh, generating polynomials CI 
remember these are just the traces of uh, your curvature form wedged together i times. Uh, so any monomial of sufficiently high degree in these generating polynomials ci is sent to zero in the Durham cohomology of the manifold. And the proof is fairly simple. Uh, so what Bott noticed is that this, the normal bundle of the foliation always admits what are called Bott connections. So these are covariant derivatives whose associated connection forms are given in foliated coordinates by um, expressions of this form. So remember that the connection form is a matrix of one forms. So this is the omega ij. And what he showed is that you could always choose connections where omega ij is equal to some sum of the dyks. Remember the y denoting the transverse coordinates. Um, and then it's very easy to show that if you take a sufficiently high degree polynomial in the curvature of any such connection form, uh, you get zero automatically. And essentially this is true by dimension count. So of course, if you have a, uh, a Q-dimensional vector space and the, um, the exterior one power generated by the DYIs is a, a Q-dimensional vector space, at least at, at a point, and you wedge um, Q plus one of these vectors together, you automatically get zero. And this is essentially what uh, Bot's vanishing theorem follows from its simple dimension count. So what does this tell us? Well, it means we can take our polynomial algebra generated by these polynomials CI, and we can quotient it by the ideal I sub Q generated by all the monomials in these CIs uh, whose total degree is greater than 2Q. And what Bot's vanishing theorem then tells us uh, we also obtain this corresponding algebra, WOQ, now with an underline. Um, so instead of having just the ordinary polynomial algebra here, I'm taking the quotiented polynomial algebra, but we still have these transgression forms in here, uh, crucially. So what, uh, oh yes, and it's worth mentioning as well that the cohomology of this new algebra, underline WOQ, is far more interesting than the cohomology of WOQ itself. So by quotienting by this ideal here, we actually obtain additional cohomology classes which we didn't have before. So for instance, uh, there's, this, um, there's this class here, H1, C1 to the Q. So D of H1 is equal to C1 by definition. And then, so D of this whole thing is C1 to the power of Q plus one. Uh, but then by Bott's vanishing theorem, we know that C1 to the power of Q plus one has total degree 2Q plus two, which means it vanishes in this quotient. So this is a new uh, co-cycle that you see appearing in underlying WOQ, which you don't see without performing this quotient. And it turns out that this co-cycle here corresponds to the Gobion Bay invariant, which I was talking about earlier. Okay. So as a consequence of Bott's vanishing theorem, one is able to um, refine the previous Chernvay characteristic map. Whereas before we had WOQ without the quotient, now we have WOQ with the quotient, whose cohomology is far richer. And in particular, it encodes uh, some odd degree cohomology classes. If we take any Bott connection form on the uh, transverse frame bundle, then we get a map from um, underlying WOQ to the differential forms on the transverse bundle of metrics. We pull back by any choice of uh, metric on the normal bundle and we get closed differential forms on M. And like I said, uh, in particular, the gobion Bay invariant is represented in this, in this scheme by just sending this co-cycle H1, C1 to the Q to differential forms on M uh, via this characteristic map. Okay, uh, so with all of this, I haven't talked too much about uh, higher frames in the context of foliations. There's this folklore result which runs basically parallel to uh, Kobayashi's theorem, which says that on the bundle of transverse two frames, there is again a tautological connection like one form. And what you can do is you can prove that 
uh, torsion-free bot connections on the one frame bundle are in bijective correspondence with equivariant sections from transverse one frames to transverse two frames. And again, the correspondence is just given by the pullback of the tautological one form. Uh, so in particular, this tautological one form is itself a kind of bot connection. And um, just as we had with manifolds, if you have a Ramanian metric on your manifold, this is enough to not only determine a metric on the normal bundle and therefore a section from M to the bundle of transverse metrics, uh, but also a canonical torsion free bot connection, which is uh, called the bot Levy Shavita connection um, on one frames, which corresponds to a particular GL equivariant section from one frames to two frames. So a Ramanian metric again, gives you quite a lot. And as a result, you get this commuting diagram, which again, it's almost identical to what we saw previously. And it, indeed the method of proof is almost identical to what we saw previously. We have this tautological bot connection form on two frames, which via a choice of Riemannian metric can be pulled back. This section now corresponding to the levi chavita bot connection on one frames. And then you can pull that back again to the differential forms on M um, via the, uh, the metric on the normal bundle that is induced by the choice of Ramanian metric on M. And uh, the induced maps on cohomology do not depend on the Ramanian metric you chose. Okay, um, so just to briefly uh, outline um, or really to foreshadow one of the applications of the theory that uh, Ben and I developed, um, is you can use this commuting diagram uh, to get a fairly satisfying derivation of the, um, the gobillon vey invariant uh, via the algorithm I noted previously. So you take some one form defining the foliation, you assume your foliation is transversely orientable, <clears throat> um, and you take some Riemannian metric on the foliation. Uh, well, you obtain this a section from one frames to two frames corresponding to the uh, bot levi chavita connection determined by the choice of metric. You have this section from M to the bundle of metrics determined again by the metric G. And then you can just choose any non-vanishing Q form defining the foliation. The thing is transversely orientable, so we can always do that. And if you specify that it has unit nor with respect to this metric, then what you can do is you can show that you have this equality. So D of this non-vanishing form is this one form wedged with phi. And this one form here is taken by taking the trace of the tautological form on the two frame bundle, and then just pulling back by these sections determined by the choice of Riemannian metric. And then in particular, we get this equality between uh, the gobillon vey invariant as it would be obtained classically, which is to say, you take some form defining the foliation, differentiate it, find the form which uh, says it's differential lies in the ideal defined by the thing. <clears throat> um, and then we can realize uh, the gobillon vey invariant. Well, it, this relates to the classical construction of the gobillon vey invariant to the churn vey construction of the gobillon vey invariant. And what I'll uh, tell you about later is how this can be done for singular foliations also without having to resort to any sort of singular Frobenius theorem. Okay, so finally, on to singular foliations. So first of all, what is a singular foliation? Well, uh, singular foliations as they are understood now are extremely general objects. Um, so it's uh, been very popular in the literature recently to look at this very, very general class of singular foliations called Stefan Sussman singular foliations. Uh, so what a Stefan Sussman singular foliation is, it's an involutive locally finitely generated submodule of vector fields on a manifold. And what Stefan and Sussman proved independently is that whenever you have such a submodule of vector fields, their flows integrate to give a uh, foliation of M, but this foliation need not have leaves that all have the same dimension. Um, <clears throat> and there are a lot of examples just due to the generality of this definition. 
Uh, so Poisson structures always give you Stefan Sussman singular foliations. Lie algebraids always give you Stefan Sussman singular foliations. Um, and there's this uh, beautiful theorem proved by Andrulodakis and Scandalis in, I believe it was 2009, which shows that any foliation, even at this level of generality, admits a holonomy groupoid. Um, so finally, getting into a bit of groupoid theory and a bit of uh, non-commutative geometry. <clears throat> So even at this level of generality, you can get holonomy groupoids for these uh, singular foliations. And with these, there's been quite a lot of work done doing leafwise non-commutative geometry and leafwise index theory for singular foliations. So this has already been a fairly successful endeavor. But one thing that remains to be done is to um, find traces on the K theory of uh, the C star algebra associated to any such holonomy groupoid or generalized traces, cyclic co-cycles, with which one can pair the indices of these longitudinal operators to produce numbers. Now for regular foliations, this is something that's achieved with these characteristic classes. So what Connor Moscovici showed is that all of these characteristic classes define cyclic co-cycles on the K theory of the C star algebra of the holonomy groupoid associated to the foliation. So you can pair the cyclic co cycles coming from these characteristic classes with the indices of longitudinal differential operators and thereby obtain numbers, uh, topological invariants of the foliation. But this remains to be done for singular foliations. And this is largely because the leaf spaces of singular foliations are not especially well understood yet. Um, now, my collaborator and I found it necessary to focus on a subclass of these Stefan Sussman singular foliations. It seems like Stefan Sussman singular foliations, their leaf spaces are just too pathological to do any sort of leaf space characteristic classes with. But if you restrict yourself to what are called Hayfliger foliations, um, you can do some useful things. So I'm going to let gamma Q denote the groupoid of germs of local diffeomorphisms of Q-dimensional Euclidean space. This is often called the Hayfliger groupoid. And then by definition, a smooth Hayfliger co-cycle of co-dimension Q on a manifold. Well, it's given by two things. One is an open covering of M and then a morphism from the check groupoid associated to that open covering to the uh, groupoid, the Hayfliger groupoid gamma Q. Um, I'm assuming these morphisms are smooth, by the way. So uh, gamma Q admits a uh, naturally groupoid structure. So does the check groupoid associated to an open color. So this is a morphism of etal Lie groupoids. So what does this mean? Let's break it down a little bit. Well, it means that for any point in an intersection, uh, U alpha intersect U beta, you get one of these germs, uh, gamma alpha beta X which satisfies this co-cycle property. That's what it means to have a morphism of Lie groupoids here. Um, now, in particular, if you look at the degenerate case, so U alpha intersect U alpha, <clears throat> by the co-cycle property, you know that these gamma alpha alphas have to be germs of the identity map, but they're germs of the identity map where? Well, that, that question where determines a smooth function from U alpha to Q-dimensional Euclidean space. So this is this Y alpha from U alpha to Q-dimensional Euclidean space. Now these are always smooth functions because I'm assuming that my morphism of etal groupoids here is smooth, but it's not necessarily a submersion. So one wants to think of these as defining transverse coordinates, just like in the regular case, but because these are not submersive, um, it means that the leaf space is no longer locally Euclidean in the way that it was for regular foliations. There are, you get singularities corresponding to the critical points of these smooth maps Y alpha. <clears throat> okay, so it's, well, I, I think it's not true that every Hayfliger co-cycle gives rise to a singular foliation in the sense of Stefan and Sussman, but if you insist that the complement of the singular locus for a Hayfliger co-cycle, so the singular locus is the set of all critical points of these uh, transverse coordinates, Y alpha. If you look in the complement of this singular locus and you insist that that complement is dense in the manifold, then you do get a Stefan-Sussman singular foliation. 
Um, and the way you get it is by looking at the vector fields which annihilate, whose Lie derivatives annihilate your, your transverse coordinates. Um, and it's by density of the, uh, the regular sub, the, this complement of the singular locus that you get the locally finitely generated requirement for a Stefan Sussman singular foliation. So here's one example. Uh, this is the foliation defined by this uh, transverse coordinate map, fxy equals x squared plus y squared, gives you this beautiful foliation by circles with a single critical point in the middle. Uh, this is a bit more complicated, a little bit more interesting. This is the foliation of uh, the Lie algebra SL2 that you get from the co-adjoint action of the Lie group SL2. Alternatively, you can think of it as being defined by this Casimir uh, f x y z is x squared plus y squared minus z squared. This is a singular foliation in the Stefan Sussman sense, but not in the Hayflicker sense. And essentially, the problem is that in any neighborhood of the singularity here, the only uh, first integrals of the foliation are constant functions. So, what that means is that the foliation can't be defined by first integrals or transverse coordinates in the way that um, Hayflugger foliations must be by definition. <clears throat> okay, so why would we expect to see characteristic classes popping up for these singular foliations? Well, essentially it comes down to work by Hayflugger done in the 70s and 80s. So Hayflugger showed that Hayflugger co-cycles on manifolds are classified by continuous maps from your manifold into this classifying space B gamma Q. Hayflugger also showed that there's a universal characteristic map sending the, uh, the algebra of characteristic classes that we have here to the cohomology of this classifying space. So in particular, if you have any Hayflugger co-cycle corresponding to a map from M into B gamma Q, you can do this composite morphism and you get a, a characteristic map from characteristic classes to the cohomology of the manifold. So this is the theorem due to bot. Um, <clears throat> Well, I, I actually, Bot showed that this uh, this composite coincides with the Chernvay homomorphism we discussed earlier. So the question arises: Well, you can do Chernvay for regular foliations, and you can get these uh, universal characteristic classes from them. Can you do the same for a singular foliation? So we have some co-dimension Q singular foliation associated to some Hayflugger co-cycle, given by this classifying map. Can we realize this characteristic map at the level of geometry using a Riemannian metric? And there are a few uh, sub problems that pop up as a consequence of this. Um, so one knows that outside of the singular locus of any singular foliation, uh, you do have transverse frame bundles because outside of the singular locus, your foliation is regular. So you have these transverse frame bundles and you can define a characteristic map for this regular sub foliation. Um, but then how do you guarantee that the, dif the differential forms you get from this churn Bay construction extend in a smooth way across singularities? So that's question one. Question two, even if you can guarantee that these forms extend smoothly over the singularities, how do you know that those then global forms uh, represent the cohomology classes they should be representing? So in other words, how do you know that they agree on cohomology with this universal characteristic map. And then the final question is, uh, what sort of geometry is necessary to build representatives that extend smoothly across singularities? Um, and the answer is, it turns out you need singular metrics effectively. And the, the corresponding uh, connections thought of as sections of frame bundles necessarily blow up towards singularities. Okay. Uh, so like I said before, the transverse frame bundle of a singular foliation can't be defined globally. You can only define it over the uh, regular subfoliation. But even in the singular case, and in fact, this is true for arbitrary Hayflugger structures, there is a substitute. Uh, so there is what's called the Hayflugger bundle or the Hayflugger frame bundle. Um, people have used this bundle in the literature before, but it was never... Uh, well, generally it seems to have been confused with the, the transverse frame bundle. And there's a good reason for this, which I'll get to soon, but crucially this Hayflugger bundle makes sense for any Hayflugger co-cycle, singular or not. Uh, so the way we 
constructed is just by pulling back the frame bundle on q-dimensional Euclidean space via these uh, local first integrals, y alpha. And then we glue them together along the, um, the cocycle, along the, uh, the change of coordinate diffeomorphisms defined by the Hayflugger cocycle. So this gives us a, a, a fiber bundle defined globally over the manifold M. And it turns out uh, there's a tautological uh, GL valued connection form on the Hayflugger two frame bundle. And then what you can do is you can show that if you do essentially the churn vey construction for the Hayflugger bundle, uh, you get the correct characteristic classes. So this is a theorem that my collaborator and I proved in our recent preprint. <clears throat> um, and actually, it's not all that surprising. I mean, it, this is exactly the sort of thing that should work if you take some section of two frames modulo OQ um, and you obtain a corresponding characteristic, correct, characteristic map obtained first by mapping to differential forms on the Hayflugger two frame bundle then pulling back via the section. Uh, this map on cohomology agrees with the universal characteristic map. So we have a substitute for the transverse frame bundle. The problem is, how do we now relate the Hayflugger frame bundle to the intrinsic geometry of the manifold M? And I, in my opinion, this is where things get interesting. <clears throat> well, uh, in the regular case, like I alluded to earlier, um, it's possible to identify the transverse frames with Hayflugger frames. And that's just by post-composing with the, uh, the transverse coordinates, Y alpha. And provided you're on the regular set of a singular foliation, or if you're on a regular foliation, so that the transverse coordinates really are submersions, then these composites, Y alpha of phi, they are local diffeomorphisms of RQ. So when you take their k-jets, you really are looking at the k-jets of frames of Euclidean space, which is to say k-jets of embeddings from RQ into RQ, local diffeomorphisms. And then the co-cycle property of the uh, Hayflugger co-cycle guarantees that this identification is actually global. It doesn't depend on the, uh, the chart you're working in. And then we know that we can construct sections of transverse two frames via a choice of Ramanian metric, transverse two frames modulo OQ. So uh, if we take some Ramanian metric, we get a section of transverse two frames. We can push it forward to a section defined only over the regular set of uh, Hayflugger frames. And then all we do is we ask for this section to extend smoothly across singularities doesn't make sense to ask for that to occur just on the transverse two frame bundle because that bundle doesn't make sense over singularities. But the Hayflug of two frame bundle does make sense across singularities. So it actually makes sense to ask for your section to extend smoothly across singularities then. Um, right, I, I think I already more or less covered that. So this leads us to our, our, I guess, main definition. We say that a Romanian metric is one adapted if the uh, section of one frames extends smoothly across singularities when mapped over to the Hayflugger bundle, and two adapted if it extends to a smooth section of the Hayflugger two frame bundle across singularities. And then one of the main theorems of our paper is that uh, one adapted metrics exist for all singular foliations. Two adapted metrics are a little bit trickier. Uh, we were only able to prove that two adapted metrics exist for foliations whose singularities are, are localized in some sense to stay entirely within single Hayflugger charts. Uh, and if you look at our preprint, you can, um, you can see our proof for this. Uh, but the end result is if you have a two adapted Ramanian metric on the complement of the singular locus of your singular foliation, then you do get this section of the Hayflugger two frame bundle by definition of two adapted. And as a result, you get a Chernvey-esque map from your algebra of polynomials, oops, to uh, the algebra of forms on your manifold M. And this characteristic map defined in terms of the Ramanian metric, once again, does make this diagram commute. So in other words, we found a Chernvey map for singular foliations. But crucially, the Ramanian metric that goes into building this Chernvey map 
is only defined on the complement of the singular locus. And I'll show you visually why that has to be the case now. Uh, so here's an example of a singular foliation. Um, it's defined by this Hayflager function. And it has a family of critical points, which is in a figure eight shape uh, going through here. Unfortunately, it hasn't shown up in the, in the Wolfram plot I did, but there's a, a figure eight worth of critical points. And if you graph what the adapt, the, uh, well, there's, there's a, a canonical adapted metric you can associate to this F. And if you graph what the associated adapted one frame looks like, it's this. So here the Z coordinate corresponds to the, uh, the fiber of the one frame bundle sitting over the manifold R2. And you'll notice that the adapted one frame thought of as a section of this fiber bundle blows up as you approach, it, as you approach singularities. And in some sense it has to, uh, because you have this singular locus here where the fiber bundle is not defined. Similarly, uh, if you look at this uh, cuspidal function f, you get a, a cusp's worth of singularities cutting through the middle here, and the corresponding uh, graph of the adapted one frame is like so. So you can see again the graph blows up as you approach the singular locus of the foliation. Okay, so just before I finish up, is a quick application of our results, which is to give a uh, gobion Vey algorithm for singular foliations. So remember the gobion Vey algorithm takes a uh, form defining the foliation. You take D of it, you find that D of it is equal to eta wedge the form itself, and then you do eta wedge D eta to the Q. Well, in the singular case, this is much more complicated. Uh, and this is essentially because singular differential forms, that is differential forms which are allowed to vanish, their behavior is much more complicated. There is no easy Frobenius theorem for them. The closest thing that we were able to find was a pair of papers by Morgrange. So Morgrange gives sufficient conditions for a singular differential form to be locally given by uh, a wedge of differentials of, of first integrals. Uh, the problem is that Malgrange's theory only applies to holomorphic and analytic differential forms. Um, and moreover, the relation to Hayflager structures is not clear. Uh, so what my collaborator and I did instead is we approached this problem via churn theory in essentially the manner that I outlined for regular foliations earlier in the talk. So we have this theorem. Uh, if you have a singular foliation, which is transversely orientable in the sense that the uh, complement of the singular locus is a transversely orientable regular foliation. And if your foliation admits an adapted metric, then you can find a singular Q form, which uh, restricts to the complement of the singular locus uh, to a non-vanishing form, which defines the foliation thereon. And when you differentiate it, you find that there's a globally smooth one form on the manifold for which you have this uh, familiar equation, d phi equals eta wedge phi. And then it's not too difficult to show that eta wedge d eta to the q um, with, a, with a minus sign is a closed form and it represents the gobion Bay invariant. And again, this follows from the the churn Vey homomorphism that I uh, introduced earlier. And the proof is relatively easy. It's essentially the same as the, uh, that for regular foliations. You just need to be careful that all these forms do extend smoothly across singularities. But this follows essentially because we're working with an adapted metric, which is a metric which vanishes as you go towards singularities. Uh, so phi turns out to be an adapted one frame for this uh, top degree co-normal bundle of the regular subfoliation. And eta is the connection form induced by the bot levy shavita connection with respect to this one frame. And then the equation d phi equals eta wedge phi, this follows by the fact that the bot levy shavita connection is torsion free. And finally, the fact that the class in cohomology you get from this construction coincides with the gobion Bay invariant follows from the churn Bay homomorphism. Okay, uh, so there's, I'm just going to uh, mention a, 
couple of um, directions for future work, which I think might be quite interesting. The first, of course, is uh, in the regular case, these characteristic classes give rise to cyclic co-cycles, which pair with the K-theory of the non-commutative leaf space, and you can get numerical invariants out of these things. So the question is, does this continue to hold in the singular setting? My feeling is yes, uh, but I, I don't uh, have much to offer on the, the technical details of how this might work. But I, I suspect the Hayflieger bundle uh, will probably come into it, and the explicit construction of such cyclic co-cycles will probably involve adapted metrics. Um, this is, I would say, actually related, which is, can you compute localization formulas for uh, characteristic classes. Uh, so, you know, this is an analogy with the uh, Atiyah bot localization formula, for instance. So that these localization formula tend to work in uh, the setting of equivariant cohomology. And for those of you who have studied this sort of stuff, you'll know that cyclic co-cycles, uh, cyclic cohomology for uh, Lie groupoids is very closely related to equivariant cohomology. Uh, there's another question, can you ad ad generalize the construction of adapted metrics to more general singularities? And finally, because of the difficulty we had in constructing adapted metrics, I suspect that uh, the moduli space of adapted metrics, however one might make sense of this, uh, this might be an interesting space. Um, so I think this is worth investigating as well. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you very much for the talk. Um, are there any questions or comments? All right, um, questions? Uh, yes. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, uh, so, uh, so on your page 14, I think you mentioned this uh, cons construction of, uh, uh, how to say, the, the space of uh, metrics. Uh, oh, yes, the bundle of metrics. Yeah, yep. yeah bundle of metrics, yes. And uh, I believe uh, I believe that in his construction, the most uh, yeah interesting thing is that the manifold itself has uh, an embedding into this bundle. Mm -hmm. he, he, you have a, a, a section S. Yeah, that's right. In, yeah, in his notation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, in, so so in your work, is there any usage of this uh, sort of embedding? Stuff. Yes. Yeah. So they, these are implicit all the way through. Okay. Um, so these uh, these sections that you mentioned, which give you an embedding from the manifold into the bundle of metrics, yes. these are in bijective correspondence with Ramanian metrics on the base. Yes. And uh, in the case of regular foliations, these mm -hmm. embeddings are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, Euclidean metrics on the normal bundle of the foliation. And in the singular case, it's a little bit more complicated, but something similar is still true, uh, which is that um, embeddings from of your manifold into the bundle of metrics associated to the Hayflieger frame bundle rather than yes. the transverse frame bundle, these are in bijective correspondence with uh, adapted metrics on the normal bundle of the regular subfoliation. So okay. this is this is basically by definition of adapted metric. Uh, where are we? Yeah, one adapted metrics, in fact. So you get such an embedding for every singular foliation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments? Well, then, in that case, let's uh, we thank the speaker again.
And um, let me mention that next week, uh, we might have another talk, our last talk by Pedram Hekmati, but that needs to be confirmed. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Hopefully- Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Lachlan, thank you. Bye-bye.